Thank you uh, very much indeed, and uh, welcome. It's great to see many of you here, uh, and congratulations for making the choice to come to a session that's going to be a little bit different from everything else you're going to hear at this event over the next two days. So thank you for coming. And I want to start just by a, a few quick thank yous. First of all, thank you to the Royal Academy of Engineering, who are represented here today. Uh, thank you to the Engineering Council. Thank you to RS Components, uh, Publitech, and also to 19 Group, because all of those people have worked with us to help to make today possible, and we couldn't do it without the help of our supporters. So a big thank you to all of those. Now, we are Engineers Without Borders UK, and we're a not-for-profit. We work closely with practicing engineers, we work with students, we work with educators, we work with the pro professional uh, engineering institutes, really to close the skills gap in engineering. And um, at Engineers Without Borders UK, we have great faith in the role that engineering can play to revitalize uh, the economy in the UK. But we also passionately believe that engineering has great potential, and not only potential, but also responsibility to do enormous good. Now, engineering, you don't need me to tell you, is the problem-solving profession. Engineers are the world's innovators. The great achievements of engineering throughout history are the result of technical competence, resourcefulness, and a can-do attitude that all engineers possess, but also determination, vision, and creativity. And throughout history, engineers have proven that time and time again. And in today's world, we need that more than ever. We really need to be able to address the challenges that we face today using all of those skills. And our engineering companies and engineering companies across all sectors face the usual challenges of the ups and downs of the economy, which I'm sure you'll hear a lot about while you're here for the couple of, a couple of days. But there's much bigger challenges ahead beyond that, beyond the day-to-day, -day, beyond the year-to-year. -year. There's a climate emergency. We risk a biodiversity collapse. We are consuming resources at an unsustainable rate. And we're pumping dangerous levels of toxins into our natural environment every day. These are real threats. And they're all real threats that come from human activity. And engineering touches every area of human activity. There's nothing you can touch, nothing you can feel, almost nothing you can experience that somehow hasn't been influenced by the engineering process. And we want engineers to help us face up to those challenges and really take the opportunities that come with facing up to those challenges. And that's what we're here to do today. We want to help you do that, and we've been working on it for the past 18 months. Now, uniquely, what we have done at Engineers Without Borders UK is to establish an approach that spans education and practice. Uh, and in order to embed the skills that we're going to need in future. And at the heart of our approach is a belief, a fundamental belief, that we can ensure a prosperous future for humans while also regenerating our planet. And we call this global responsibility. Now, we're working with the Royal Academy of Engineering to embed global responsibility into university teaching through degrees so that graduates will enter the workforce of tomorrow with the skills that are needed in the workplace. But today's conversation is not about universities. Today's conversation is about how we are supporting practitioners to help you prepare for the challenges that we're going to be facing increasingly. Now, over the next 40 minutes, we're going to introduce to you the Global Responsibility Competency Compass. Why it's needed, what it is, and how it can help you as individuals or as teams or as entire organizations. Now, this tool is free. It's been endorsed by the Engineering Council and it will grow as more people use it as, how, as we learn to see how people uh, put it into practice. So, without further ado, I'm going to show you a short video which explains the tool before we have our panel discussion. Engineering plays a pivotal role in meeting the needs of society. 
Engineering can significantly contribute to addressing global emergencies like climate change, biodiversity depletion and fuel poverty. Responsible engineering can deliver a safe and just future for us all. Yet few engineering companies believe they have the skills to deliver on sustainability. We urgently need to upskill and empower our engineers to consider people and planet in their practice. That is why Engineers That Borders UK has developed the Global Responsibility Competency Compass. The Compass is designed to support individuals, teams and organisations across the engineering spectrum to balance the needs of all people within the limits of our planet. This inclusive tool will benefit practitioners across the engineering sector, whether you are a practicing engineer, project manager, ecologist, or those that feed into the process of engineering solutions. The Compass is backed by Engineering Council, which sees it as progressive interpretation of UK professional standards. So, how does it work? Well, the Compass breaks down into 12 key competencies to deliver sustainable, equitable and ethical results. Individuals can use the Compass to support self-assessment. It provides a template to create a sustainability skills action plan using a learning library of relevant professional development opportunities and resources. Embedding this tool into your day-to-day -day will strengthen the evidence you have to attain and retain professional qualifications. The Compass also helps managers or team leads to identify and articulate the strengths and gaps in team capabilities regarding responsible engineering. Using the Compass to empower your teams and ensure projects deliver the greatest benefit to people and planet. The Compass can also support engineering organisations to assess and bridge the sustainability skills gap across their workforce. Engineers Without Borders UK Global Responsibility Competency Compass supports lifelong learning whilst navigating a complex and uncertain future. Embedding the tool into your daily work routine will give you confidence that you're applying responsible engineering principles at every level. Securing a safer and more equitable future for all is the best possible legacy we can leave following a career in engineering. The future of our planet is everyone's responsibility. We must act now. Become a responsible practitioner and start using the Engineers That Borders UK Competency Compass today. So I'd like to invite up to the front our panel. So panelists, if you'd like to take your seats and I'll introduce you, please. So I'll, 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 I'll move in the order that people are sitting so it'll be easier for you. So closest to me, Cleo Parker, who is a chemical engineering the student ambassador at the University of Birmingham and president of the Birmingham University's University um, en en Engineers Without Borders UK chapter. Thank you. Uh, next to Cleo is Emma Crichton. Uh, Emma is uh, head of engineering at Engineers Without Borders UK. It was her voice you heard on the video. And Emma herself is, she's smiling, <laughs> is a chartered civil engineer with six years experience are working in the water industry in Scotland. Next to uh, Emma is Jonathan Fashionu, and Jonathan's a mechanical engineer, and he's the founder, uh, uh, he's um, uh, also a certified passive house designer, and Jonathan happens to be uh, an EWB uh, change maker, he's an ambassador for our cause. And at the end, we've got Richard Jeffers. Richard's a mechanical engineer and founder and managing director of RS Industria. So thank you, welcome to all of our panelists. Um, I'm going to put a question to each panelist in turn and then questions from the floor. So I'm going to start with, with Richard. Um, Richard, having seen the tool and with all of your experience in industry, what are the sorts of benefits you would foresee for a company such as yours? I think it's incredibly important to have a you know, a compass, a guide for um, developing engineers at every stage in their career to, to see what good looks like and how to take their careers forward. 
Uh, and, and there's you know, frameworks like UK Spec, which are incredibly helpful at the start of the career. And, and I think this compass will be brilliant for then continuing to coach and support career development engineers as they move into more and more senior roles. Thank you. Do you want to say a bit more? You referenced UK Spec there. Do you want to say a bit more about how the compass might, might relate to, to the standards that, that you see in industry? Yeah, I think you know, UK Spec you know, is, is, is the document that, that as an engineer you, you get to know and learn in the uh, early part of your career and then you try and remember not to forget it in the later part of your career. Uh, you know, it's about, you know, the, do, do I understand engineering? Do I, can I do the maths properly? You know, the first two parts of the framework. But then later on, it's into the really exciting things, which is, you know, am I, am I behaving ethically? Am I doing the right thing for, for society as well as the right thing for the business? Uh, and am I, you know, able to lead people through change and, and bring them along the journey with me? And, and I think this, this compass will really help build out sections, uh, you know, particularly D&E within the UK spec um, uh, and, and help people to understand how they should do it uh, as well as the what they should do. So the whole spectrum of opportunities there that go beyond the purely technical skills. I'm going to ask Jonathan to come in now. Jonathan, you're, you're, you're running a company, you're running multidisciplinary teams with very complex challenges and interconnected. How do you see it uh, benefiting for uh, your kind of uh, uh, organisation? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I think the, the biggest part is it being a multidisciplinary tool. So it doesn't necessarily just look at engineers solely. It looks at everybody operating in that space. Like, for example, we have a multidisciplinary company that looks that borders around architecture, project management, and construction. And having a tool that allows everyone in the team move towards becoming more inclusive, more purposeful, more regenerative, to me, it's um, it, you know it's a win for. It also allows us to set a vision or a purpose that we want to head towards together as a team, and allows all the individual members to play a part in their own personal development on their journey towards that purpose. So a very interesting idea about building up the purpose of the team. Just just elaborate a bit on 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 the skills then, because this isn't just for individuals. This is about skills across a whole team. So, do you see yourself kind of building a team around this the skills that are in the competency companies? Oh, absolutely. I think the skills. I, I think the nice thing about the tool is it doesn't look at your technical competency. It looks at ethics and values of how we can deliver a higher order of value to our clients and to society at large. So that allows us to almost map out where the team needs to be and needs to grow and develop in order to get there. Thank you. Cleo, can I turn, turn to you next? Um, you're about to embark on a, a long career, a long successful career, no doubt, as an engineer. Um, what does it mean for you? How, how do you see this kind of supporting a career path for you and, and for you, your colleagues who are graduating right now as well? Um, so university has taught me a lot of fundamental skills to do with engineering, but it's really through engaging with engineers that borders UK that I've learned the sustainability principles that surround kind of engineering. And so I've learned things like facilitation, sound reasoning, and also advocacy, but it's kind of learning how to apply those in a professional setting. Um, and also looking at this tool, I've identified competencies that I'm missing that will make me a much better engineer for the future. So things like the um, system thinker mindset, where you kind of are able to appreciate all the different problems and how they interact with each other and come up with a solution that solves all of them rather than just solving them individually and possibly wasting resources and time. Um, and then another one is the mitigating and adapting skill. So designing something that's going to adapt with time and still meet its purpose over its life cycle as the world is changing around us. So kind of they're both part of the regenerative principle of global responsibility and that's where I'm missing the most in my skills. Um, so they would be the places that I would focus on. Um, but this tool is also going to help me as I work towards my chartership. So I'm hoping that once I graduate, I can start on that journey and that this tool will help me tie in global responsibility principles to what I'm learning in my professional life as well. So I think it's a very interesting idea. There's some gaps there in the university education, which is not surprising. Uh, and also this idea that the professional engineering institutes need to engage as well, because you're, you're thinking about chartership. And this could help you towards chartership if the institutes were, were working on this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's what Perfect. I need. Perfect. Wonderful. Emma, um, 
you're a professional chartered engineer, so you've got lots of experience in the water industry. So maybe bring a sector perspective to this. How do you see this tool being relevant to you and your experience? Um, so I'm 33 um, and I was chartered seven years ago. And um, I think what really speaks to me is I'm really proud of being an engineer. I'm really proud of being part of this community. I'm also really worried about our climate and biodiversity emergencies and what I will see throughout my life, but also my career. I'm likely to retire in 2065 or 2070 and actually imagining what does our profession look like as it transitions and participates in a re the really urgent and necessary transition to net zero and beyond. But also how do we bring out the creativity and the untapped potential of so many people working in our profession. I think this tool is exciting because it celebrates the vast breadth of skill that we need within our profession to be able to work with communities, to be able to think about the complexity of sustainability, of adopting inclusive approaches, of being able to understand what is ethical when actually we are now pushing at the limits of what technic, you know, technology can do. Um, you know, it's really important to be able to ask those questions. So I think this is a people-based tool. It's about investing in the, the capabilities of the people within our profession. And I think it's really relevant for me because I've seen certain things move through the profession since I've been within it in 10 years. You know, digital is a bit of a move comes through. I've seen greater diversity within the teams that I've worked in. Um, but there's still this, you know, niggle in me on how do we make working in the water sector or the energy sector or the manufacturing sector as creative and as collaborative and as aligned with what the world needs once more. So how do we shift from some of those practices that are designed from the Industrial Revolution, like my great-grandfather who was the previous engineer in my family, um, to the globally responsible practices we need today. And that's all about cultural change and upskilling and really asking those bigger questions. So I think it's relevant for me to stay within this profession. Um, that, that's why I see the value in this tool. So, uh, so it's interesting because what Emma's talking about really is like, how do you navigate where you are and what learning you need to, have to do to get the skills and knowledge and the mindsets to be globally responsible. And I think it's worth, Emma, just if you could talk a little bit about what sits behind this, because we're presenting the compass to you today, but there's more behind it. There's a, there's a whole library of learning, which we haven't yet mentioned. So do you want to say something about that, Emma? So the compass helps translate some of the complexity around what are the knowledge, skills, and mindsets that are useful to do things in a sustainable, equitable, and ethical way. But also knowing that professionals are busy they might not have time to step out and do a PhD or a master's. And actually we want this you know, ability to be able to learn on the projects in which we're working on, be able to apply learning and up to date and relevant and stay ahead of the curve. So the learning library, which is associated with this tool, it's online, um, provides professionals with practical learning that suits their needs. So it we've gone through and looked at the range of different you know, programs and courses and resources that really help people. Um, and then we're providing that in a space that people can access. So I'm not sure if I'm explaining this very well, but um, yeah, it's, it's, you've got the competencies, you know what they are, but also we've, we've curated a library of really useful resources and courses and programs so that when somebody says, what can I do? They, they can get to the point of actually doing something useful rather than trying to explore um, very broadly in order to hopefully land on something. So we're trying to signpost and provide professionals with what they need most, which is if I'm busy, I want to use my time well um, and, and learn something that's valuable that builds my competency. That's what we've been trying to curate um, and point to a whole range of organizations that provide that. So you can identify your needs, you can get pointed to what learning you might do. Learning might not come from us, it could be from many organizations and it's available online uh, through our website uh, and, uh, as, and it will grow, right? So this, we're launching this, but over time, 
the more that the tool gets used, the more content we'll put in the digital library, the more we'll hear about how people are using the competency compass, perhaps in ways that we haven't even thought of ourselves, and it will start to grow and take on a life of its own. That's very much what we'd like to do. Before I open it to questions from the floor, I'm just going to go down the line and ask everyone the same question. So starting with, with you, Richard, um, this is the question. The, the world of work is evolving at great speed. How is this tool going to help you um, navigate your future career? So, um, the world of work is, is evolving at great speed, but there are also some, some truisms that, that, that remain. Uh, you know, engineering principles don't change. Uh, the need to, you know, care about the planet, care about the people, care about each other's and teams is not going to change. So, yeah, the technology is changing, but actually the, the underpinning you know, principles are staying the same, and I think this, you know, this um, compass will help. You know, people remain focused on the really important stuff throughout the career, and not maybe get uh, dazzled by the tech that comes out. Okay, so keeping focus on the really important stuff. Okay, Jonathan. Yeah, I know. Uh, just echoing what um, Richard was saying around, as we develop our teams to be more regenerative and more inclusive, it allows us to look at different communities in which we are discussing and bringing our solutions to. So, um, for example, in my firm, which is a small firm, we have a bit of work which we're looking to do globally as well. And being able to bring these values, they transcend uh, technological solutions to communities. And it will help us as a company and as a team to ask the right questions to the communities that we're bringing these solutions to. So it's really keeping you really relevant with the needs of the communities. So those values. Perfect. Emma. I, this tool, I think, helps me to articulate that, yes, I'm an engineer, but I'm also an advocate for the idea of global responsibility and pull out some of those strengths that I didn't know about, but actually using a tool like this allows me to understand that actually I'm reasonably good at facilitation, I have a skill set there, and it's something that maybe I could develop and build on. And as the world of work changes, and maybe as my role as an engineer might change, I could lean on that strength and that skill set more and more, um, and use it in di different and creative ways. So yeah, I think it's giving me a, a kind of fuller picture of what my role as an engineer, and what strengths I might bring to different yeah. work opportunities in the future. So additional level of awareness, if you need, uh, uh, as, as you might like say. Wonderful. Cleo, final word goes to you before we open it to the floor. Um, how's it going to help you navigate your future needs? Well, as someone who's right at the beginning of their career, I'm likely to end up in lots of different places, lots of different roles. And this is kind of like a foundation that I can fall back on and I can keep consistently throughout my career and always look at how I'm doing against these 12 competencies um, over time. So. My role might change, uh, I might gain my chartership and then move on to the next thing, but this compass, this tool will still be there for me to look at and see what have I developed over the last 10 years, where am I still missing gaps, where can I further my knowledge. So it's really one consistency <laughs> that I can see in my career um, as I go through that I can always judge my performance on based on where I've come from and where I want to be. Good, so really keeping a sense of how you're doing as a professional and how you can continue to develop throughout your career. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to open it to the floor. Um, we'd love to hear as many questions uh, uh, as, as you can give us, so please, any questions, put your hand up, let, let us have them. We're, 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 you know, we're only too happy to, uh, to discuss this. I can see a, a hand already right here. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, if you couldn't hear it, the question is, is there any uh, plan to be able to measure and track progress against the competences? Uh, I'm going to ask Emma to re respond. Yes, yes, there will be, and more and more. So um, at the moment, we're asking people to complete an action plan where they understand their own ambitions, how this might be relevant, but also their learning needs to then be able to select relevant learning from the learning library. Um, so with that process as well. In the future, we're hoping to be able to share and curate action plans so people can see what others are up to and understand that space. Um, in terms of the levels of competency, we are looking at a self-assessment tool 
to go from kind of core, give a greater definition of core competency in different areas and how that might show or be demonstrated in practice, but also what advanced competency might look like as well. So we're going to work with teams to be able to create and understand that team action plan space, um, but also help provide different and sorry, help provide more clarity on the different levels of competency so that people can be able to see where they might have room to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. A any other questions? Sure. Yeah, thank you. There's a gentleman at the front. Thank you. How much does the, uh, the library or the toolbox go into other aspects that will impact engineers? So, for instance, the circular economy, is, are the resources around there for engineers to tap into? Yeah, Emma? So, yes. So, you know, once, once you've got the tool in front of you, I think you'll see that what we're promoting through this is real deep knowledge of different approaches. And one of those is life-centered design, which very much mirrors you know, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and the tools and resources that are there, the idea of circularity and what that really means in terms of you know, products don't have this end of life and then they're dumped, is the continuation of that. Um, so yeah, there's, we're pointing to wonderful resources um, that are available within that really active space. Let's bring you the mic across. Uh, I think this sounds like an excellent tool to, to do best practice um, and so looking forward 10, 20 years as the climate crisis worsens, particularly impacts of it, who is the arbiter of what is ethical, um, particularly from a professional standards point of view and the chartering bodies, where does that come into play to, to anyone? <laughs> Okay, so who's the arbiter of ethical standards in the future? That's a great question. <laughs> Is there anyone in the audience want to answer that one? <laughs> so, so John actually works for me, so, uh, and, he, and he, hasn't, he hasn't prepped me with this one. Uh, so I can tell you who the arbiter of ethical standards in our team is, which is, which is John, uh, because he's, you know, he's so passionate about uh, you know, the, the climate crisis that's, that's, that's you know, in front of us. And, you know, he acts as the conscience within our team. And, and I think it's, you know, the arbiter is going to be, you know, people like you, John, who, who hold the mirror up and go, you know, it's not good enough. Uh, you've got to change. Uh, Emma, do you, want, do, you want, do you want to add to that? Um, I think it's a great question because I think the values on what we think is good, what we think is ethical, what we think is right, changes and has changed quite a lot over the last, you know, however long <laughs> throughout time. Um, obviously, there is like the statement of ethical principles and code of conduct within, within the professional practice and engineering council holds a statement of ethical principles in the Royal Academy of Engineering. But I think it's really interesting when you ask that question of, say, a doctor or somebody in the medical profession is who is the arbiter of, of ethical practice? Well, it, one depends on the context. It also depends on the situation. So I think it's a really live and evolving space that we need to have quite a lot of focus on in terms of how can we provide the best outcome of the work that we do in this profession. So I think... <clears throat> It's a space that I don't think we are yet actively having as a cultural feature in our workplaces. And I think we need to see more of that. We're seeing you know, the need for it come out of generative AI, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, that's been called on for, for a long period of time. So I think a tool like this could provide engineers a seat at the table in a broader societal discussions because actually this isn't our responsibility to decide what is ethical for everybody else in the world. It's actually to be able to take a seat at the table in those wider conversations within society as well. Yeah. There's a contribution here. Yes, hello. To the question of ethical, um, I'm Juliet from the Royal Academy of Engineering um, and completely endorse what Emma's just said there. And you have to remember that in this country, engineering is a self-regulating profession. Um, engineering council, professional engineering institutions, we all have to stand up and be counted. And indeed, that's, that's what happens. So sort of a plug here for next week, um, next wen Wednesday, 12.30 to 1.30, a webinar where we're launching um, a review and audit of engineering ethical cultures in the UK. Mm. And you will see we have lots of things to be proud about. You know, engineering is very ethical in this country, judged globally. 
Um, but also, there is more work to be done, and, and that is absolutely clear. The review, there's a, it's a huge study that we're publishing on Wednesday, and there's going to be a panel debate, and you'll see that actually the profession is stepping up and saying, we understand we're okay. Apparently, we are the, by some sort of um, measurement, we're the second trusted profession in the, in, in the country. Um, I think nurses were the first. <laughs> um, but that's pretty high, and certainly a lot higher than our political leaders. So, you know, I think engineering has a lot to be proud of, but there is a lot more to do, um, and we are publishing that work on the anniversary of Grenfell Tower. So I think you will understand why there is more work to be done there. So, but at the end of the day, this is a self-regulating profession. It's up to engineers themselves to stand up and be counted, but held to account also by the public and by others. So I think there's, there's much more work to be done here, and this tool, I think, will help the engineering profession do exactly that. I think that, just to build on that, I think that there's also the question of things like litigation against companies now, litigation with companies who are seen to be greenwashing or not, not following sustainable practices. That is happening. It's a real business risk for companies. And I think, um, how do you avoid that? And I, one way to avoid that is to try and have processes but I don't really think that's the answer. I think really what's the answer is you have a workforce that has the right mindset, that is thinking about sustainability, thinking about ethics and so on, when it's going about its day-to-day -day business. Because the processes kind of, they take you so far, but it's really about how the humans within those processes act. And this is fundamentally what this is all about. It's about giving people the skills and mindsets, not only to act sustainably, but also to be, to be advocates for that and to be confident in, in talking about these needs within their teams and organizations. Any more questions? We'd love to take some more. I've got one. Yeah, please. Um, you, you started the presentation with, um, you know, uh, fuel poverty, the, the planet, etc. Uh, and then Emma, you said you'll retire in 2065, 2070. Are you, is the panel members um, hopeful for the future? And if so, what do you think it'll look like if you could think that far ahead? Based on what you're planning now, what, what legacy will you leave behind if you could have a crystal ball? That's a tough question, isn't it? But, you're, but you, you know, we talk about the future and, and you're <laughs> the ones that are mapping it. Yeah. I'll be dead by then, so... Um. I'll go first to give the others a moment to think about it. Um, am I hopeful for the future? Uh, yes, and deeply worried. And um, like people are suffering today from our climate and ecological emergencies. Um, we might not be hearing those voices today, but that is happening. And I've looked very logically at the contribution of engineering of you know, big industry, light industry, manufacturing, um, transport systems, energy systems, and water systems, sewage systems. Actually, if you add all of that up, we are a 70 plus, you could argue it even higher, contributor to, to greenhouse gas emissions. So actually, we can champion individuals to do particular actions. You know, that is not a bad thing to change your lifestyle. But actually, the bigger impact comes from the practices that happen within engineering. So my hope for the future is that our profession can bite off the biggest chunk of the change that needs to happen. That's not very articulate, but I, that's what I mean is that I think if this profession could lead and evolve and transition, it would have a knock-on impact tangibly in terms of how successful we as a humanity are to keep our safe climate and rich biodiversity of life. Um, and final point, I think, what do I see for the future? I would love to see more diversity within engineering. I would love to see us being framed as a creative profession. When people think of creative professions, they don't jump to advertising, they jump to engineering. Um, uh, and I think being able to live in a way that, you know, my values at work reflect the values that I have and want to give on to, you know, if I should ever have children, that type of thing. So, um, and finally, I don't think hope is enough. Um, so that's why I hesitate on hope, because actually, 
I think <clears throat> my ability to make change, to, to have an impactful career is, is based on my ability, not on the words that I say. So I think the actions that I will take, I think will be far more important, but also I think the actions that we all can take is far more important than companies coming out and saying lofty things, gaining all of the marketing from that, is actually it's the, the ability to then meet the things that we say will keep us the trusted profession of the future. Um, otherwise, a big question mark should be on that. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, I'm very hopeful. I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And the conversations they're already having at that age um, gives me a bit of comfort that they seem to know what they're talking about more than what our generation or the generation before us knew what they were talking about. This, what this tool is helping is really what the next generation needs to be able to look with optimism, uh, with, with, yeah, with opti optimism at the future and basically go, you know what? I'm able to be part of that solution. And I think that's what's really important. What this tool gives, you know, people like Chloe that are coming out of university is one, agency. It gives them the ability to be responsible and take ownership for the solutions they're putting out there into the world. And it also allows them the level of empathy and compassion to be able to step in the shoes of other people and basically go, this is what's going to happen. So those are, I think, the three ways in which this compass can be really useful in how it shapes the thinking of everybody that is using it. And as long as we steep, uh, like, for example, the engineers without borders, as long as they keep on trying to challenge and change the norms of engineering education, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty hopeful, yeah. The, the, the challenges are undoubtedly significant, uh, and, they, and they require long-term thinking, not short-term thinking, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, this, this tool and, and, you know, other associated initiatives, you know, across the globe are going to help people focus on you know, what's really important for the long term uh, and give people a North Star to aim towards, which means that we will overcome these significant challenges. Um, I think my perspective is I come from a community of people who are about to enter the workforce and the real drive for change is there. Um, I hear it in conversations every day about the change that people want to make. Um, I think it's just being able to go into industry and having an environment that supports advocacy in that sense, um, and also having engineering education that backs that up and encourages those kind of competencies to be developed, um, because I think right now the passion is there and the understanding of the planet's boundaries is also there and the skills we need, but it's just having that supportive environment to help us get there, um, to kind of make sure that we see the future that we want to see. I would just add, I, I'm not an engineer, right? But it, it just seems to me the engineers of the past, they weren't daunted by challenges. You know, they, you know when Brunel built the first iron ship, everyone said, you can't build a ship out of it. You just did it, right? When the Wright brothers learned to fly, they, just did, they weren't daunted by the challenge. And I think it's that can-do attitude, it's that ambition, it's that willingness to really kind of grapple with the seemingly impossible it is a marvelous thing. If we can nurture that through this uh, compass, we'll be doing a great deal to motivate the right people to try and make the difference that we can make and we have to make. So that, that's where, where I come from on this. I wonder, is there one more question from the audience before we wrap up? Oh, it's two more questions, excellent, even better. So the lady just at the back. Whichever one, okay. Why don't we, why don't we we'll take the two questions, then we'll let the panelists answer them together. All right, my question is to the young lady finishing the university. For me, the challenging things is that when I'm employing people in, in uh, my organization, when it's, you know, engineers, when they come young with ambitions like you, the problem is that I'm facing it. I don't think so the education system is in that level with your patients because the things what you're learning in the university doesn't prepare you for the real job. So from us, like example, with the government organization like NHS, 
we need to put you in the training program at least for six months before we get it to our standards of requests of working. Do you see it need to be changed first from the university, the way the teaching progress is going, the teacher teaching you? Because for me, I feel like it's more theory, not so much practice. Do I'm correct or wrong? I don't know, you can answer it. But I have quite a lot of challenges. Okay. Do you want to answer that? Are you happy to answer that straight away? Yes. Can I just repeat the second part of the question? Just the final yeah. part of the question. I didn't quite do. So could you just repeat this, the final part of the question? Because the way I understood it, if, if, if I can interpret it, is the fact that there's nothing quite like hands-on experience. Getting in the workplace ah. or maybe going through some real training, such as apprenticeships, whereas the theory that maybe university students and others are getting, does it transfer or do the two work together? Um, so, during my degree, I've done a lot of group projects, a lot of different things, um, and I've also had two summer internships, and those have given me the chance to kind of see how I can apply those skills that I'm learning. But it's true that I think there are lacking opportunities for hands-on um, situations because it is different um, than in education in a safe environment where, oh yeah, your profit isn't exactly amazing. Um, but kind of taking those in an industry um, and seeing how it works, it's quite, it's quite daunting as well because I think when you go into industry, they're not always receptive of the ideas that you bring as well. There is a lot more kind of red tape around um, making things happen. So it's kind of encouraging students to learn that, yeah, you're going to be stopped <laughs> sometimes. Um, and sometimes it's worth challenging those red bits of tape, but sometimes that's just not going to happen. But you've got to figure out a different way of how to get around it. Um, so I think hands on opportunities, there's definitely a space for them in university um, for more chances to do things like that. Um, but the fundamental skills are there um, and being taught well. So it's just how we integrate those two things together. It's an interesting, because it is part of what we do. We weren't really planning to talk about this, but through the university systems, we run design challenges, which are helping to prepare graduates for those very practical real life problems and the complexities of those. I just wonder, Emma, do you want to say a word or two about the design challenges? Yeah, I think, you know, Clio has participated in the university system. You know, whether, whether it's designed as well as it could be, isn't obviously something that he was responsible for. But I think um, there is a really active space and question mark of what is the best use of the, the education that brings you on to become an engineer and then you know, work more in practice. Um, and we do run um, programs as part of degree courses. Um, and in the UK, reach almost one in four engineering students as part of their degree. And what we've been able to do is kind of have a really active conversation, you know, through our partnership with the Royal Academy of Engineering as well, with universities saying, you know, need to be reshaped. Degrees do need to be reshaped. Um, so <clears throat> that is a piece of work that we're focused very much on in terms of what does this mean for workplace? Yes. But also what does it mean for the educational system more broadly? And I think um, that's a really important component. But people will spend longer in practice. They'll spend decades and decades in practice. So also, you know, how can companies harness the passion of future generations coming in to help companies address their own skills gap as well? You know, John, John talked to a statistic around, you know, 93% of companies that have a sustainability strategy do not think they have the skills to meet it. So, you know, how can we bring in and nurture some of that passion to be able to be part of addressing that gap as well? Um, yeah. It's part of the unique thing we've done. So we've got this idea of global responsibility and we've set the four principles and then we're applying it to education and to employment at the same time. So the two kind of mesh together, which I think probably no one else has done. So this is very much what we're trying to do. Education, employment skills, how do you align them around a common set of principles that are going to meet the future skills needs? I think there, w there was going to be another question over here. I'll, um, I'll keep it brief, and maybe it's three that can answer this because Chloe's new to a, a career. Um, but what I see here is what you're trying to do is make a change, but there's going to be lots of barriers in the way that we've built up over the years, going back from the Industrial Revolution. 
for each of the panelists, what one barrier would you want to remove for your industry that just enables this to make it easier? Complacency. You go first. I'm still, I'm still <laughs> thinking. Uh, I think. for companies to really integrate this rather than have it as an add-on or side-on or if you happen to have a passionate person in a team to be a conversation. So, yeah, I think one barrier is moving from it being very ad hoc sometimes to being actually a real core part of learning and development for all staff and, you know, part of the culture of the organization and in a similar way to other, you know, safety is, is a core part of culture um, so yeah it's quite a big barrier but I'd go for integrating this fully with a kind of quite strategic approach to that yeah I would say accessibility because um, our industry is not as diverse and inclusive as it could be um, so just really as an industry looking at the barriers that don't allow those to access our industry and really having to think about whether they're absolutely essential, you know, to whether or not they need to be there. So I think with tools like this that work on um, inclusion, we'd be able to reduce those barriers or accept a wider group of people into our, into our industry. I just want to give, give Cleo a chance to say something because you, you, you haven't seen the barriers in industry, but you have spent the last three or four years doing a degree so you've some sense of barriers perhaps in the education sector that you is there something you would change in education that would help this uh, I think it would be the slow moving. Um, so I have had many discussions with our head of education um, in the chemical engineering school about what changes I want to be. I've been a student voice ambassador for the past two years um, and I've worked tirelessly to try and um, get student voices out there and get the opinions happening. And everything just moves so slowly. Um, we have to fight and fight and fight to get something to happen. Um, and one of the things I questioned um, while doing my degree was the lack of multidisciplinary team projects um, within our course. So um, chemical engineering is very separate at university to the other engineering degrees, and I don't fully understand why, because in my third year design project, I ended up having to do a little bit of civil engineering and a little bit of mechanical engineering when I'm actually a chemical engineer, and I didn't understand why I couldn't just work in a team like I would in industry with a civil engineer and a mechanical engineer. Um, and I was just told, oh, it's, it's not really possible with schedules or we can't make it work because more of this discipline will sign up than that discipline. And I don't think that really cuts it. I think you have to make it happen um, because things like that are lacking. So I would want to kind of take down those barriers of, oh, it doesn't work because of this, or it doesn't work because of that. Just try it and see what happens, because I think it will make the future better of education and engineering. I, I think that's a, if we have one quote from today, just make it happen. <laughs> uh, Cleo, you've, you've, you've summed it up in, in, in two or three words. That's just brilliant. Um, any more questions before we wrap up? OK, I'm not seeing any more hands. I do hope. Uh, you've been excited by what we've presented today. We're excited about it. We, we think there are great possibilities. We hope you'd like to learn more about it. So come and find us. We're at Stand L40, I believe. <laughs> I remembered it correctly. L40, just down that way. Come and talk to us. We're here tomorrow as well. Um, our website uh, also has all this material on it. So look us up, Engineers Without Borders UK. You'll find us uh, through Google very easily. Uh, and, and download and look at everything we've got. But please do engage with us uh, in future. We want to hear feedback from you. We want people to get involved in everything that we're doing, not just through the compass. So thank you very much for coming, and please stay engaged. Thank you. Thank you.